All right, so in this problem, okay, the force on a charged particle is V cross B. So what you want to do is you want to figure out the force on a positive charge, and if the charge is negative, the force will be in the opposite direction. Okay, okay so in this case, the magnetic field is coming out of the sheet, and you want a force in this direction. Okay, now you see if the velocity of a positive charge is in that direction, you turn the velocity, oops, this is velocity, this is magnetic field, V cross B, if you turn a screw from here to there, it'll move downwards, okay? So the force on a positive charge will be in, in this direction with that velocity, okay? So on a negative charge, the force will be in the opposite direction if it moves to the right. Did you guys understand that? Okay. So again, if a positive charge moves in this direction and the magnetic field is coming like that, you turn the uh, <coughs> velocity vector to this direction, the force will be in that direction. So the force on a positive charge is there, so the force on the negative charge will be in that direction. So. For part A, what does it say? What is the direction of the velocity uh, of a negative charge? So the negative charge, moves to the right. All right, um, I'll do one more, let's do this one. Okay, so in this case, the magnetic field is going into the sheet and the force is to the left. So let's do the following. Okay, now here's another thing. The, mag uh, the force is perpendicular to the plane containing the magnetic field and the velocity. Okay, so the velocity has to, um, so this is, uh, uh, the velocity has to be perpendicular to these two guys. And um, so, all right, so let's say the velocity is in this direction. So for a positive charge, the velocity is in this direction. So, and the magnetic field is like that. So V cross B, if you turn V to B, the force on a positive charge will be in that direction. Did you guys understand? If you turn a screw like that, the screw will move like that. So you want the force to be in that direction for a negative charge, so you just get the negative charge moving in the opposite direction. Okay. So for C, the negative charge moves downward. Okay. Again, this is the force equation, and what you want to use is the right-hand rule. You turn a screw from V to B, and the direction in which the screw moves gives you the direction of the force. So for a positive charge, V to B, if you turn a screw like that, it'll move downwards. Okay. If you move turn a screw from here to there, it'll move that way. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes, Samuel? What's that? You don't understand this? Okay, the magnetic field is into the plane of the paper. Okay, so, uh, all right, I will do it this way. I was recording it, that's why I was so the magnetic field is into the plane of the paper. There's the velocity. V cross B. For a positive charge, the force will be in that direction. So if you want the, if you want, if the charge is negative, make the velocity in the opposite direction to get the same force. Okay. So if the charge is negative, make the velocity in the opposite direction and you'll get the same force. Okay. I'm sorry? Wouldn't the negative charge move to the left? Okay, well, 
for the so the force on the positive charge is in this direction. Yeah. So if the charge is negative, the force will be in the opposite direction. So if the charge is negative. Okay, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and you you guys try and figure out B. Right, so again, um, the best rule to remember is, so for a cross product, you turn from the first vector to the second vector. If you move a screw in that direction, figure out the direction in which the screw moves. Okay, so if you turn a screw like that, it'll move like that. If you, if you turn a screw like this, it'll move outwards, okay? <coughs> A cosmic ray proton, so what this is telling you is that that proton is not coming from the sun, but from a, another source in the galaxy or uh, probably from another galaxy, okay? So this is a cosmic ray proton moving toward Earth at uh, 5 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. Do you guys know the sp speed of light? It's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So this is roughly 10% the speed of light, okay? 20% the speed of light, and this is relatively slow. Experiences a magnetic force of uh, that many newtons. What is the strength of the magnetic field if there is a 45-degree angle between it and the proton's velocity? Okay, so they give you... Again, the force is QV cross B. The magnitude of this force is given by Q V B sine theta, where theta is the angle between the two vectors. Okay. And this is a proton, so we know its charge and so on. Okay. So the strength of the magnetic field is the magnitude of the force divided by QV sine theta. All right, let's put in the numbers, 10 to the minus 16 newtons. <coughs> 19 coulombs, five times 10 to the seven meters per second times 7 sine 45. All right, so let's take care of powers of 10. That'll make this 10 to the 3. So 1,700 divided by 1.67. And this will be in Teslas. All right, uh, so it comes to the top, we'll make that, okay, I guess I didn't take care of that. All right, so it'll become again 1.7 times 10 to the minus four, divided by 1.67 into five into sine 45. So, And this is point two nine into ten to the minus four Tesla. Okay. Equal to point two nine Gauss. Remember ten to the minus four Tesla is a Gauss. All right, uh, does this kind of field ring a bell?
what is the Earth's magnetic field? Strength of the Earth's magnetic field. That is about half a gauss, this much, okay? So this is, and this makes sense, moving towards Earth. So this is the Earth's magnetic field, okay? So this is a, at a little higher height. On the ground level, it's slightly stronger. All right, in part B, it says if the value obtained, is the value obtained in part A consistent with the known strength of the Earth's magnetic field? Yes, it is. Okay. So this says a cosmic ray electron moves at 7.5 times 10 to the 6 meters per second perpendicular to the Earth's magnetic field at an altitude where the strength is 10 to the minus 5 tesla or 0.1 gauss. What is the radius of the circular path the electron follows? <clears throat> All right, so let's first figure out which way it will it'll circulate. Or, okay. So let's say if the magnetic field is into the sheet of the paper. So let's... Um, now we'll give the electron an initial velocity like that. What will be the direction of the force? So V cross B, um, V cross B going into the paper, the force would be up on a positive charge. The force would be in that direction on a positive charge. On a neg negative charge, it will be like that. So it will go in a circle like this. Okay. So if uh, a field is going into the sheet, you throw a negative charge in the plane, it'll go in clockwise circles. And a positive charge, of course, will go in on anti-clockwise, counterclockwise circles. Okay. All right. So since it's going in a circle, what do you need? What makes... A centripetal force makes it go in a circle. And the centripetal force is provided by the magnetic force. Okay. <coughs> so the centripetal force is provided by the magnetic force. Mv square by R, the radius of the circle is QVB. Okay. That's the magnitude of the force. Uh, v and B are perpendicular to each other, so that sine theta, so, sine of 90 is 1. So the magnitude of the force is QVB. Okay. All right. What is the radius? Is We're trying to find the radius, so... The radius is M, V, Q, or B, okay? So what does this say? The greater the mass, the greater the radius. So, uh, for instance, a proton in the same field, the mass of a proton is 2,000 times greater than the mass of the electron. So a proton's radius would be 2,000 times greater for the <laughs> same velocity and all that, you know? All right. So, mass of the electron is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kg. <coughs> the velocity is 7.5 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. The charge of the electron is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs and 1 times 10 to the minus 5 tesla. All right, let's take care of powers of 10. That's, that gives you 10 to the minus 12, uh, 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 1. So... 0.911 into 
divided by 1.6 into 1. And this is a radius, so it'll come out in meters. Okay. So this electron is going in this Earth's magnetic field. And remember, it's traveling at 2% the speed of light. It's 2.5% uh, the speed of light, actually. So the radius is 4.27 meters. So roughly the size of the circle is the width of this room. Again, the diameter of this circle. So that's the... Okay. Do you guys understand? Yeah. All right, an electron in a TV CRT tube moves with the speed of that in a direction perpendicular to the Earth's field, which has a strength of 5 times 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. What strength electric field must be applied perpendicular to the Earth's field to make the electron move in a straight line? Okay. <clears throat> if you check your notes, we will uh, see that there's something called a velocity selector. Okay, so back in the old days, what? So this is uh, what they did. Okay, so they would heat a wire this wire would spit out electrons and these electrons would come out with all kinds of speeds and um, so here's a magnetic field and these are metal plates okay so if an electron is moving in this direction in a magnetic field v cross b the force on the electron would be uh, so the force on a proton would be in that direction. So the magnetic force on the electron would be in this direction. Okay. And uh, if you had a electric field in this direction, so if the electric field was in this direction, the electric force would be in that direction. On the, okay. All right, so the magnetic force depends on the velocity and the electric force just depends on the charge. So for this force to cancel this force, only the right velocity, only the correct velocity would balance these two forces. These, for the right velocity, these two forces would be balanced and this, these electrons would come out. That's why it's called a velocity selector. If the electron was moving too slow, it would deflect in that direction. If it was moving too fast, it would deflect and hit this plate. Okay. And so if you check out your notes, so, well, so the electric force is Q times E and the magnetic force is QVB B. So V equal to E over B. Okay, so charge particles whose velocity were uh, E over B, E over the strength of the magnetic field, only those particles would come out straight. All right, so you would get a velocity selector and then you would have deflecting plates 
you would have deflecting plates, um, um, two plates, one deflecting this way and another deflecting up and down. Okay, so this will deflect up and down and then you would have another plate deflecting sideways. And what you would do is you would deflect the electron beam and hit a phosphorescent uh, dot and this would light up. Okay, so this is all inside a TV and you're sitting there and watching this thing. Okay. So I don't know if you've used CRT tubes, but um, anyway, that's how this thing worked. So the problem itself is simple. Okay, what strength electric field must be applied perpendicular to the Earth's field? So you see the Earth's field is like that, and the magnet and the um, and there's the there's the electric field. So the electron moves in a straight line. Okay, you want the electron to move in a straight line. So. So V equal to E over B. So the electric field is V times B. That's the field you need to apply. Okay. And the velocity of the electron you selected was six times 10 to the seven meters per second. Okay, this is 20% the speed of light. And B is one times 10 to the minus five Tesla. Okay, so six, 600 volt per meter. And then B, if this is done between plates separated by, so your, this field is created between plates separated by one centimeter. One centimeter is that much. Okay. What is the voltage applied? Okay, so this electric field is, okay. and you saw that uh, voltage between the plates is the electric, um, no. the voltage between the plates is electric field times the distance. Okay, and so the voltage applied is 600 volts per meter, and the distance between the plate is one centimeter, which is 10 to the minus two meters. Okay, so six volts were applied between the plates. All right, so this problem says a wire carrying a 30 amp current passes between the poles of a strong magnet that is perpendicular to its field and experiences a two point, um, um, experiences a 2.16 Newton force on a four centimeter of wire in the field. What is the average strength of the field? Okay, so let's say this is the region in which you have the field. And this field is into the sheet of the paper. And there's a current, okay. So what is a current? Let's say it's, uh, you can think of it as a bunch of positive charges moving in this direction. Okay, and you have a charge moving in the presence of a magnetic field. 
it will feel a force. Okay, what will be the direction of the force that this current carrying conductor is felt is feeling? In what direction will it feel a force? So there's the velocity, there's the magnetic field V cross B, it'll feel a force in that direction. Okay. So the force will be in that direction. Okay. And the force is given by I L cross B. Okay. L is the vector, is so I is the magnitude of the current, L is the is a, this length, the length of the wire, and the only relevant length is the length that part that is in the magnetic field. This part of the wire doesn't uh, count because there's no magnetic field and this part of the wire doesn't feel any force. Okay? Only the part that is in the field feels a force. So that is that length, which is four centimeters. Again, L cross B will be a force in that direction. Okay, so remember B is in this direction. Okay, so and this is L. All right, so again, the angle between the L vector the angle between the L vector and the B vector 90 degrees. So the magnitude of this force is I L B. They're asking you for the strength of the magnetic field. Okay. So the force is 2.16 Newtons. The current is 30 amps. And uh, the length is four centimeters. Okay. So, and this works out to so. B is 1.8 Tesla. That's a very strong field. Okay. So uh, magnetic forces are not that strong. This is a very strong field. That's not a large force. Okay. All right, this problem says, what is the maximum torque on a 150 turn square loop of wire, 18 centimeters on the side, that carries a 50 amp current in a 1.6 Tesla field? Again, strong field and uh, 18 centimeters, so it's uh, roughly half a foot by half a foot square wire. What is the torque when the angle theta is 10 minus? Okay. So here's the square wire carrying a current like that. And uh, <coughs> what does a loop of wire carrying a current behave like? What is this guy? A loop of wire carrying a current, what does it act like? This is a magnet, it's an electromagnet, okay? And uh, what you do is, so if you point your fingers with your right hand in, in the direction of the current, your thumb points in the direction of the magnet. So this is behaving like a magnet, okay? With the north pole there and the south pole there, okay? And the strength of this magnet, okay? So here's the direction of the magnet, mu. And the strength of this magnet, mu, is given by n, the number of coils, times i, times the area, okay? And a, the area vector is pointing in that direction, okay? Again, the direction of the area vector is you point your fingers in the direction of the current, 
and the area of active points in the direction of your thumb. Okay. All right. So that is the strength of the magnet. And uh, if you have a magnetic field in this direction, what the magnetic what does the magnetic field do? It tries to turn the magnet to line up with the, mag the magnetic field. Okay. So it exerts a torque on the mag magnetic moment. It, the magnetic field turns this guy in there, and the torque is given by mu cross B. Okay, so what is mu? Mu is the strength of the magnet, uh, magnet, magnet, which is called the magnetic moment, and the magnetic moment is given by N. What is N? Number of what? Turns of wire. I is the current flowing in the wire, and A is the area of the loop. Okay. Okay. So this is the strength of the magnet. Uh, again, this is called an electromagnet, and you see, you can make a strong magnet by just winding up a lot of wire. Okay. You could also pass a large current, but you know, if you pass a large current, you get a lot of heat. Yeah. But uh, so you can make a magnet. What is the advantage of a electromagnet? You can turn it on and off. Okay. All right, so if you bought a strong magnet, a permanent magnet, you can't turn it off. You got to deal with it at all times. Okay. All right, so you can turn it on and off. So this thing, the maximum torque is that. And the magnitude of the torque is mu B sine theta, where theta is the angle between mu and B. Okay. So what is the maximum torque? For maximum torques, theta is 90 degrees. Okay, so the magnetic field would be like that, and there's the torque, and it's trying to turn this guy into that, toward the magnetic field. So torque max is mu b. Yeah. All right, now we can put in the numbers. How many turns did, does it have? It has 150 turns. The current is 50 amps. That's a large current. So this is a very strong magnet. Okay, and it's in the presence of an another strong field, 1.6 tesla. Okay, that sucker will turn. So this this is the sort of stuff that happens where inside an electric motor. That's what an electric motor does. It passes a current through a loop of wire in the presence of a magnetic field and that electric energy is converted to mechanical energy. You guys understand? So that's what happens in a Tesla car. There's a permanent magnet in their electric motors. Okay. The battery sends a current through loops of wire which turns, which turns your, the wheels of your car. Okay. All right, so The electric motors provide instant torque and large torques. That's why electric cars can accelerate much, much better than most gas cars. Yep. Do you think electric cars are going to overtake gas cars as far as? Nobody's going to make gas cars in 10 years. Ford says otherwise. <laughs> yeah, all right. And The stated goal of Toyota is I, Toyota is not going to make electric cars after 2035 or what, what before that. Because right now they go more of like a hybrid, like a gas car. Right. Yeah. Do you think an electric car could ever beat a gas car on the, on the top end of like speed though? Yeah. Because right now they can. They can. The sportsters will sportster will beat anything. It can't go three hundred miles an hour. Pound for pound, <laughs> they'll beat them. Look it up, pound for pound, it'll beat them. <clears throat> That's what I understand.
so 12,000 Newton meter. Pound for pound and dollar for dollar, they'll be. <laughs> I mean, you need a Bugatti to try and compete with the Sportster. And, yeah. uh, so. That's the only thing. Mm -hmm. Right now, would you get an electric or a hybrid? An electric, electric, if I had the money. Yeah, an electric is out of my range right now. I forgot. <clears throat> Point one eight square. So three eighty eight point eight Newton meters. Okay, so that's the torque on that thing. Have you driven a Tesla? No. I want to. Yeah. You guys can go to the town center and sign up in Jackson to test drive it. What is the torque when the angle is 10.9 degrees? So you just put 10. This is the maximum torque. Then times sign 10.9 degrees. Okay. And you guys can do that. So, okay. So for part B, tau is mu B sine 10.9. Okay. All right, maybe I'll solve one more problem. All right, maybe two more problems. Okay, so a proton has a magnetic field due to its spin. Uh, Again, any moving charge produces a magnetic field. So uh, all protons and electrons spin. Okay, so, so here's a proton. And in the next chapter, you'll learn about the strength of these guys. Okay, so if a proton is spinning like that, there's the magnetic moment. It points like this. This is a proton. If you have an electron that is spinning like this, okay, spins in the opposite direction, okay? And the strength of the magnet, oops. So for a current carrying loop, the strength of the magnet was N times, what was N? The number of loops, I times A. For a spinning proton, it's E, the charge, times H bar, divided by 2ME. So let me make sure of that expression. There. So that's for a spinning electron 2ME. Okay. Okay, same. So that's the strength. This is the strength of the magnet for an electron. A proton has a mass 2,000 times greater than that. So this magnet is 2,000 times weaker than this magnet. Okay. So if you have a spinning electron, which is, uh, which is a magnet, and you have a spinning proton, this guy is talking 2,000. This magnet is 2,000 times stronger than this magnet. Okay. So remember that. Okay. So... <clears throat> a proton has a magnetic field due to its spin. The field is similar to that created by a circular loop. 
So circular loop, uh, 0.65 times 10 to the minus 15 meters in radius and a current of uh, 10,000 amps. Find the maximum torque on a proton in a field of 2.5 Tesla, okay? So first we'll do is, what they're saying is for the proton, the current is that much, 1.05 times 10 to the 5 amperes, and the radius of this loop is 0.65 times 10 to the minus 15 meters. Yeah. All right, so what is, uh, there's one loop, so the strength of this, the strength of this magnet is I times area. Okay. N is 1. So what is this? This is this how strong a magnet a spinning proton is. Okay, that's what we're finding. And let's calculate that. So this is I times pi R squared. Okay. I is 1.05. So this works out to, that's 10 to the minus 30. So 10 to the minus 25. And this will work out in amp meter square. Okay, so that's the strength of the magnet. Well, that current is to the four. Mm, okay. All right, so that's the strength of the magnet. And what do they ask you? Find the maximum torque on the proton in a 2.5 Tesla magnetic field. So this would be in an MRI machine. Okay? And that's what they do, they, the mesh, that the torque is on the proton, okay, so. So the max torque is given by mu cross B and the maximum torque, yeah, so if this is B and that's mu theta, torque is given, the magnitude of the torque is mu B sine theta.
and max torque would be when sine theta is 1 so mu times b all right so you have this uh, 1.4 times 10 to the minus 26 amp meter square is the magnetic moment of the proton and you put it in a 2.5 tesla field and so this works out too Three point five into okay, so that's the maximum torque. So this is a significant torque on a small particle. All right, um, do you guys remember what a mass spectrometer is? A mass spectrometer is what can weigh a single atom, for instance, okay? We have one in our chemistry labs, so here's how you do it. Uh, so if you, let's say you want to weigh an atom, what you do is you first ionize it. Okay, so you remove a single electron, and here's the atom. Then you p pass it through a then you pass it through a velocity selector. This velocity selector will only let so what you do is you heat these atoms, and so you're from the oven you're spitting out a bunch of them. <coughs> at different velocities, they're all ionized. And when you send it through a velocity selector, as a, only ions of the precise velocity will come through. And then you send them through a magnetic field and they'll go in a circle like that. And you, you hit them in a detector there, okay? So you measure the radius of this thing. And the radius, the more massive this is, the greater the radius. Okay, and that's how they weigh single, single atoms. Okay, so you measure the radius and you cal calculate the mass. Okay. <clears throat> Did you guys understand that? Okay, heavier the ion, greater the radius. So, so heavier ions will hit there, more heavier ions will hit there, and so on. All right, now listen, so check this out. This is a good problem, so. A mass spectrometer is being used to separate common oxygen-16 isotope from the much rarer oxygen-18 isotope. Okay. Taken from a sample of old glacial ice. Okay, so what they can, what they do is, for instance, they'll go to Greenland or some, or Antarctica and stuff like that. So there is a layer of ice the ice layer covering these things can be three kilometers deep. Three kilometers is from here to US 1. All right. So here, you guys have heard of ice core samples. When did this snow fall? Long time ago. This snow fell after that. This snow fell after that. This snow fell after that. Okay, so let's say this fell. This fell six hundred thousand years ago. Okay, the ratio of these isotopes depended on the temperature at that time. This ratio depends on the temperature. So there's oxygen trapped here, or or, or actually, I mean. In the snow itself, in the water, there's oxygen, H2O, okay? So based on the ratio, you have a temperature record. Here's a proxy of the 
Earth's temperature for all those time periods. Did you guys understand that? Okay, so you get a little bit of snow out of here, measure this ratio, and you know the temperature there. You get a little water out of there, okay? Measure the ratio and you get the temperature there. So that's how they know these temperatures, you know? Okay, so here is the temperature. So there is a, see, ice cores are a window into the past hundreds of thousands of years. Okay, so here is an ice core that's been pulled out. And you take water from there, calculate the ratio, find out the ratio of oxygen 18 to 16. And here is the temperature. So, Antarctic temperature changes across the ice ages. Okay. And that's very similar to global temperatures. Okay. You guys understand? So that's what this problem is about. Okay. All right. So... Uh, the relative abund abundance of these oxygen isotopes is related to climactic temperatures at the time the ice was deposited. The ratio of masses of these two ions is 16 to 18, and the mass of oxygen 16 is that much. And they're singly charged and travel at uh, uh, five times, so they're singly charged, and the velocity selector selects these velocities and they go into a 1.2 Tesla magnetic field. So this is a 1.2 Tesla magnetic field that's making them go in a circle. So the radius depends, the mass, the mass and radius are related. What is the separation between this path? Okay, so let's say this is oxygen 16, and oxygen 18 will go in a bigger circle. And Delta diameter, that's what we want to find. Yeah. All right, so what is the separation between their paths when they hit a target after traver traversing a semicircle? Yeah. All right, uh, so again, the centripetal force is equal to magnetic force in this region. MV squared by R equal to Q, V, B, R is equal to M, V, Q, B. So you see, the radius of the path is directly proportional to the mass. If the mass is 20% higher, the radius will be 20% higher. Okay? All right. Uh, so...
right? So, um, so, so they've taken singly charged oxygen 16 atom and singly charged oxygen 18 atoms. Okay. Um, actually, you just do singly charged water molecule containing oxygen 16 or oxygen 18. And then, but for now, for us, for our, our problem, we'll just say singly charged oxygen atom and singly charged oxygen 18 isotope, okay? <clears throat> so that's the radius. So radius of oxygen 16 is mass of oxygen 16 times velocity QB. And radius of oxygen 18 is So R18 over R16 is mass of oxygen 18 over mass of oxygen 16. Okay. Now, mass of oxygen 16 is given to be, okay, well, the mass ratio is 18 over 16, so 18 over 16. So what is it that we want? We want we want this distance. So we want the diameter of O18 minus the diameter of O16. Okay. So we want delta D, which is diameter of 18 minus diameter of 16. Two times M eighteen V Q B and M eighteen is 1.125 times m16 okay so 2v qb okay so that comes out and 1.12 minus 1 would give you 0 0.125 so the difference in diameter would be 2 times V times M16 QB times 0.125. Okay, what this is is this is where the oxygen 16 isotope would hit. That's where the oxygen 18 isotope would hit. That's the distance between the two spots. Okay. All right, so we have all the quantities, two times the velocities would are five times 10 to the six meters per second. The mass of oxygen 16 atom is 2.66 times 10 to the minus 26 kgs. Point one two five. The charge is it's a singly charged oxygen atom. One point six seven times ten to the minus nineteen coulombs. 
and it's in the presence of a 1.2 Tesla magnetic field. All right, so let's take care of powers of 10. That's 10 minus 7, 10 minus 1. So that is, and that 10 minus 1 gets killed by that. So 2.66 into 0.125 divided by 1.67 into 1.2. And this will come out in meters. Yeah. Okay, so this works out to 0.166 meters, 16.6 centimeters. Okay, half a feet. So this is where the oxygen 16 would hit and that's where the oxygen 18 would hit. And how do you tell what is the ratio? When they hit here, well, this spot will be much less brighter than this spot because there are fewer oxygen atoms. And the brightness will be a proxy for how many, what is the ratio. Or you could measure a current or something like that. Okay, whatever it is. <coughs> so that's how, so you guys saw that, you saw the I scores. So you saw these I scores, and then you measure the oxygen isotope ratio in these I scores, yeah. and they can get I scores up to three kilometers long, some, something like that. Yeah. All right, why don't you guys take a five-minute break, and then I'll... We'll do the lecture on the next chapter.